Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome today's panelists and the audience in the room and online to today's special briefing <coughs> by Mr. Nana Ado Dankwa, Akufo Ado, Ado, President of the Republic of Ghana. He will be joined today by Shirley Ayoko Bochwe, Foreign Minister of Ghana, Ken Afori Atta, Finance Minister of Ghana, Nana Bedua Tu Asante, Pre Secretary to the President, Reginald Harry Grant, CEO of Ghana Investment Prom Promotion Council. My panels can see clearly where some names are much easier for me to pronounce than others. <laughs> and Ramses Cleland, um, Ghana's ambassador to Switzerland. So thank you all very much for joining us. I will give first the floor to the president. Thank you very much, madam, and uh, ladies and gentlemen of the media. Welcome the opportunity to say a few words about Ghana and what's going on in our country. This is the first time I've ever been to these gatherings in Davos. And, um, I, well, for many years, I was a little bit reluctant to come here. I wasn't quite sure what I would meet. But um, I've been impressed by one thing. That is the efficiency that this gathering presents for meeting people that you would want to talk to. I think the idea of bringing so many people together in one space, politicians, business people, people from academia, the NGO community, individuals, um, it pre presents a very good uh, uh, platform for this, I don't know what the word I suppose is networking. And to that extent, I found it very efficient and, and helpful. It's also been quite educative because you go to several of the panels and the quality of the discourse of the people who are speaking, their knowledge on the subjects about which they're speaking uh, is very educative. And uh, so I mean, on both these grounds, I've really enjoyed my visit here. The climate, of course, is not to my taste. <laughs> I am a, a, a man of the forests of West Africa. I believe in the hot, humid climate. And this is the exact opposite. But uh, you have to make a balance in all of these things. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying very much my first, my, my first uh, impressions and visit to Davos. I have three things that I want to say about today, contemporary Ghana. First, the very determined efforts we're making to build a viable, durable democracy in Ghana. I think that's extremely important, especially when you look back on our history. We were the first to get independence in sub-Saharan Africa. I think that story is well known to many people who follow African history. But unfortunately, the attainment of independence didn't usher us into good governance systems. It began with dictatorship in the First Republic, and then a series of military coups and military interventions in our national life, which meant that in a very short space of time, we had gone, we had gone through three republics. The end result of it was a consensus that built up in Ghana in the late 80s and early 90s, that really the multi-party democratic system was the most uh, uh, beneficial uh, system of government for us. And the Fourth Republic that was inaugurated on the 7th of January 1993 has indeed proved to be the most enduring of the four republics of our history. The 26 now get heading on for 27 years of the Fourth Republic has witnessed three different changes of government through the ballot box. In itself, certainly as far as our history is concerned, um, very much uh, against the thrust of, of, our, of, of, of our past. And even within the African context, it's unusual 
that a country could go through these experiences and not witness any significant uh, disturbances or destabilization of the body politic. There are many people who for years used to say that democratic governance would lead to either breakdown of, of the states into ethnic rivalries or in, institute uh, instability in its functioning. That has not been the Ghanaian experience. The Ghanaian experience has been the contrary. The democratic institutions of Ghana have proved to be unifying institutions of our state. The, the constitution has proved to be a unifying factor in the development of our country. And the willingness of the, both the political class and the ordinary or, and the people of Ghana to accept the basic tenets of democratic accountability has also meant that it has contributed to the stability of our country. And that is why today Ghana is seen as uh, one of the most stable, not seen as, is one of the most stable, peaceful countries on the continent. I think a great deal of it is due to the, to the acceptance and the awareness of the Ghanaian people that democracy could be a very uh, positive form of governance for them. The second, of course, is the efforts we're making to build a strong market economy. Over the period of the, the, the Fourth Republic, most of the indices of human development have significantly improved when you compare them over the period of military and non-democratic rule. But that's the overall picture. But within it, too, we've had some highs and lows. I came into office at a time when the Ghanaian economy was in considerable disarray. Even though we, had, we were under an IMF program, many of the fundamental uh, indices of economic well-being were not present. And high rates of inflation, high indebtedness, uh, very sluggish growth, negative growth in agriculture, bare growth in industry. And that was a background. In fact, that is really, those are the circumstances that brought me into office as president of Ghana. So the three years of our mandate have been spent, first of all, in trying to restore stability to the management of our economy. Cutting down on the deficit, bringing down inflation. The deficit we inherited at on the 7th of January 2017 was 9.3%. Today is 4.5%. Inflation was at 15.4% when we came into office. It's today 7.9%. We have, for the first time, a positive trade balance. The reserves in the nation, the, the, the national reserves, uh, 2.5 months import cover uh, in 2017 has grown to 4.5 in, in the period of these three years. And generally, the, and the growth, of course, has gone from 3.6% to an average of 7% over these last three years. So you see an economy that in some ways has, has reversed the decline and is now on an upward trajectory. It has also meant that these improving uh, macroeconomic indices that we have now, we're now touted as the country that receives the largest amount of foreign direct investment in the ECOWAS of West African region. For me, the most important aspect of it has been the discipline that has been restored to the management of our public finances. We have gone so far ahead as also because it is that absence of discipline that has kept us having to resort to the IMF for bailouts, which we have done too many times in our national life. I think that if we are able to maintain the discipline that is required of us, we would have no need, and we could then proceed to, divide, to design 
our own uh, pattern, path for economic growth and development. We've gone so far as to pass a fiscal responsibility law, which is pegged and the acceptable fiscal deficit at 5% annually, and uh, with penalties that are imposed against the government if we go past the 5% limit. We are determined to make the law talk. This year's budget, which is the first full budget that has been passed in the post-IMF era, has been very resolute in accepting the discipline of the fiscal responsibility law and aspect of deficit this year, 4.5%. There were many cynical skeptics who said that it being election year, we're bound to loosen the purse strings and, 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 and do the spending that would enable us to buy the election. We've resisted that because we take the view that Assuming you were to win and the economy is in disarray, that means that all the work that we did would have to be redone. And that it was better for us to maintain the discipline and accept that the Ghanaian people have a very clear understanding of what is required to be done for us to have the progress that we need to make. So that's the second phenomenon about the, uh, the Ghana of today, which I would we think is important, the efforts of economic recovery and the data that is out there show clearly that uh, that has been the case. The Ghana Living Standards Survey tells us that unemployment in Ghana, which stood at 11.5% in 2015, is now 7.9% in 2019. So that these economic data are not just data in themselves, but they have an actual impact on the lives of people. The one, I think, also outstanding development that has taken place in the period is the revival of Ghanaian agriculture. When we came into office, we were importing even basic foodstuffs from our neighbors, plantain, tomatoes, we're coming in from Burkina Faso, from Côte d'Ivoire. Today, as a result of the program that we put in place in 2017, which we call the Program for Planting for Food and Jobs, we've reversed these, these, the, 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 this situation. And now we are now net exporters of foodstuffs again. We've had two bumper harvests in Ghana. And in the last two years, we have stopped importing maize. We have cut down on our import of rice. The prices of foodstuffs in Ghana are the lowest that we've had in nearly two decades. And all of this testified to the fact that the program for food and uh, planting for food and jobs, which is essentially a program for uh, government support for uh, Ghanaian agriculture, essentially smallholder agriculture. Our, agricultural system is not hinged on huge plantations. It's hinged on small family-owned agricultural enterprises. Uh, the, the inputs that are coming from government in terms of fertilizer subsidy, insecticides thing, uh, making available extension ser uh, services to be able to assist the farmers is a bundle of measures that have been taken, that have been put in place that has made this dramatic increase in it. Agriculture was growing at negative levels, is today growing at 7.6, 7.7%. And as I say, we are now net exporters of foodstuffs to our neighbors. We have a program also which we, have called, which we call the One District, One Factory Policy. Basically a program of rural industrialization that has as its object creating employment in the rural communities, at tackling the phenomenon of rural urban migration, ensuring that there are worthwhile jobs for young people within their rural settings, and of course, helping in the transformation 
of the Ghanaian economy. Essentially, the economy of Ghana, like the economies of many countries on the continent of Africa, have been raw material producing and exporting economies. And they are the reasons why growth in Africa has been sluggish, has led to the spillover of young, lots of young Africans trying to flee the continent. And that the solution meant required the industrialization of the continent and of our own country and taking the steps that will lead to the structural transformation. The measures that we have put in place for rural industrialization um, are also part of those measures of recovery. So I'd say that the economic um, program that has been put in place by the government since we came into office has been substantially successful. They've addressed the key uh, phenomena that needed to be addressed, the rate of growth of the economy, the expansion of employment, um, much, much stronger economic activity. And also enabled us to pay, to pay for one of the most important uh, social intervention initiatives that any government in Ghana has undertaken. When I came into office, the five years before, on an average, 100,000 young Ghanaians dropped out of the school system at the level of junior high school. Junior high school basically was the education that would take you to the age of 15. You know, how, how, what are its equivalents here? But that is the, the average age of people at junior high school, 14 to 15. And because of, because of money uh, considerations, you had over 100,000 young people who even though they had the qualifications to go further up the educational, couldn't go to it because their parents couldn't afford to pay. And I campaigned on the need for us to get that out of our national uh, uh, presence. And that the state should take on the burden of providing uh, free education at, this, at the senior high school level. The victory meant that that had to be done. And in fact, we have seen some dramatic figures that in, the, in the educational space in, our, in the country. Roughly, there were about 800,000 people within the edu secondary educational system when I took office. In the three years of the application of the free senior high school policy, we now have 1.2 million Ghana young Ghanaians within the secondary school system which means quite clearly that the 100,000 a year dropout rate that we had before I came has now been addressed, and those 100,000 are finding their place in school. It has meant some challenges in terms of infrastructure, necessarily, because the infrastructure that was in place um, uh, had now to accommodate a much greater population. But then came the question, uh, would you have to build a house before you get people to come and live in it? Or do you get people to come and live in it and build a house as you go along? We took the view that if you're going to wait for everything to be right, you never get anything done. That it was better to start. And in the process, of course, we're now vigorously addressing the infrastructural deficit that there is in our secondary school system. On that message of action, I'm just going to be mindful of everyone's uh, time, and um, especially since it's so precious here at Davos, I'm going to open up the floor to see if there are any questions before I take any additional comments from the panelists. If you have a question, please raise your hand and state your name and uh, media outlet. Mr. President, my name is Diabo Sitor from uh, South African Broadcasting Corporation. 
Uh, you've outlined envious plans um, uh, and and uh, uh, what Ghana is doing and how the economy and how well is doing, which is quite um, envious. We are quite envious as other African countries that we'd love to see economic growth at those levels. I'm curious, though, to find out about um, the country's climate change plans. What is in the pipeline? What are you actively doing? I know that there was um, a point where you are trying to introduce um, climate education, I believe, in schools. How is, is that coming along? And what is the message that you're communicating to um, international community here about um, uh, the climate? Uh, the most fundamental thing that we have done is to fuse the 17 SDGs, including their teachings on climate change, on the preservation of our ocean, into our national budget. For two years running, with our national budgets have reflected our commitment to the implementation of the SDGs. So all through the governmental system, right from the local to the national level, those commitments form part of the agenda of government. And they include, of course, the efforts of climate change. We have also taken on a big task of reafforestation, the deforestation that has taken place over the years past, of course, has led to great problems with the climate. And we have also instituted a vigorous program of combating illegal mining in the country so that we can have responsible mining in, in Ghana, which once again would have a very big impact on our climate uh, development. But it's, uh, it's a matter of concern, and, it, and, 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 it's, and like these critical issues, a great deal of it also has to do with what we need to do about education, to make sure that people are aware of the consequences of, of, of their actions on the climate. We had a second question in the room. Hi, <clears throat> Omar Ben Yedda from African Business Magazine. I've got a host of questions, but I'll... Uh, a host. Uh, I'm hoping you can no, be no, succinct. No, no, no <laughs> but, I, but I'm only going to focus on two. I wanted to speak about the uh, ECHO CFA, also the risk premium of Africa but uh, and, uh, and Ghana and uh, pricing of our assets. But I'll focus on two things. You mentioned uh, durable democracy. So uh, there's a whole debate, and it's been ongoing for 30 or 40 years, what system of, uh, of government should, uh, should we choose on, on, on the continent. But you spoke about the maturity of the, uh, of the Ghanaian people. Did that maturity happen before uh, you, uh, you transitioned to uh, this durable democracy, or did it transition after the, uh, once, once they saw the benefits of, uh, of durable democracy? That's number one. And number two, you spoke about uh, how you, uh, well, your, your set of priorities that you managed to uh, to deal with, but what are what are the headwinds that uh, that you foresee, and therefore the next set of priorities that uh, you and your administration will be focusing your energy on? Thank you. The, the 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 durable democracy. I think what really is the the decision that was made in 1992 was that after everything that we had been through, it would have appeared that we, we had gone through virtually every conceivable type of, of, of uh, governance experiment you can imagine. We began the, the, as, as a one-party state. Uh, we then transitioned to various kinds of military uh, governance. One of them was something they called union government, which meant a permanent military presence in the state with co-opted civilians in it. I mean, all of those. And at the end of the, the, the period, after some 25 years after independence, then the Ghanaian people came to the conclusion that no, really, uh, the, the system of governance that we had, we had known in the pre-colonial era, the leading up to independence, which was essentially the multi-party democratic state, represented the most uh, effective bulwark, once for the, 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 the protection of the rights and liberties of people, and also for efficient governance. So I would say it came out of, the, uh, it came out of our history, it came out of the consciousness of people that this was the best way to go forward. And then our priorities. The priorities continue to be, at the economic level, the, the, 
the process of transformation of the Ghanaian economy. We're doing so with, against the background of the fourth industrial revolution and what digital uh, technology will have avails us. But also, a major priority has to be going forward. The protection of Ghana from the, the, the terrorists and um, outrages and violent extremism that is sweeping through some parts of the Sahel. The, our neighbor, Burkina Faso, is in the turmoil of a life and death struggle against terrorism. Further down, Niger and Mali uh, are also gripped in the struggle with terrorism. Clearly, a stable, growing, functioning Ghana has to be in the sight of people who have these um, the ambitions that are fueling the jihadist menace. So the measures that we need to take to make sure that Ghana continues as a stable, uh, peaceful, developing country remain major, major priorities for us. And at the same time, and that was the third matter that I was going to speak about, was the Pan-African agenda of which Ghana is at the center. As you know, we have been given the privilege by our peers on the continent to host the Secretariat of the African Free Trade, Continent, uh, Continental Free Trade Area. The, the agreement that, brought, that has brought the free trade area into effect provides that in July this year, the AFCFTA will be in operation. The Secretariat, which is hosted in Accra, is due to be up and running by March. That is therefore also a major preoccupation of the government, to create the infrastructure, both the hard and soft infrastructure, that would allow us to maximize this new opportunity that has been given, which is really essentially that Ghana becomes a, a hub, a, a trade and investment hub for those who want, therefore, to reach this large market of um, 1.2 billion people that the African uh, free trade area encompasses with, what, two to three trillion collective GDP. So the, these are the key priorities. And within the Pan-African agenda, there's an even larger concept of how we can also build effective bridges with the African diaspora. Our belief is very strongly that the African diaspora, that is our kith and kin in the Americas and in the Caribbean, also represent a large force, potential force, for good, for our development. And therefore, we are making, we're taking those measures to build a strong bridge across the Atlantic and will also bring them into play in our national and continental life. As you know, Ghana has, last year, we initiated what we call the Year of Return, which was a celebration. Well, no, you could actually call it a celebration, but a commemoration of 400 years of slavery. Uh, the first 20 West African slaves uh, was transported to the Commonwealth of Virginia in 1619. And 2019 was the 400th year of that event. And we initiated a year-long program, which we call the Year of Return, to commemorate that fact and also to reinforce our determination that such history will never be visited on the African peoples again. And at the same time, use it as a vehicle for reestablishing and reviving and solidifying our relations with our kith and kin in the Americas. It was a very, very successful project, and it has now led us also to begin to put into place 
the measures that we look upon as beyond the return, what next? But these are the main priorities of our government in the years going forward. And we think that um, if we are able to successfully confront and deal with these priorities, uh, the end result will be a, a developed, uh, free and prosperous Ghana. And that's our goal. We'll take one more question, and then we'll close our press conference. Thank you. Judith Kurman, I'm a foreign editor at the Swiss Daily Neue Zwecher Zeitung. I'd like to come back to the question of the security in Sahel region. And I would like to know what neighboring countries, such as Ghana, could do, um, which effects you fear for your country, and how you see the foreign involvement, especially from military engagement, especially from the side of France. Thank you. First of all, what we ourselves can do, and that has always to be critical. Uh, we are the authors of the Accra Initiative. The Accra Initiative has brought together the intelligence agencies of Benin, Togo, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, and Burkina Faso. And now Mali and Niger have been added to the group of people whose intelligence and security chiefs meet on a regular basis in whatever capital they agree on to coordinate their intelligence and information about what is going on in our various countries as far as this terrorist menace is concerned. So that initiative in itself was a proactive decision that was taken uh, which we were very much involved in making sure that the collaboration and cooperation that we need to have in order to be able effectively to deal with this terrorist menace in West Africa was well established. And it is working well, and it is helping. There's also the willingness. We so far have not got any troops in the, the, the force that is being raised within the G5 Sahelian countries. They've not asked for it, and there's not, there doesn't seem to be any necessity. They themselves have it. But obviously, a major problem for poor countries, like Mali, like Niger, all, all of our countries of West Africa, is the wherewithal to be able to find the money for the arms in this world. Poor countries are having to spend inordinate amounts of their own budgets fighting this, this battle. And clearly, the assistance of the international community uh, is welcome. Uh, uh, it is in that context that France has stepped forward to offer both military as well as financial support for these G5 countries. I think that in the context of the fight in which we're engaged, because in, in any event, the jihadist uh, threat, the terrorist threat in West Africa has a large international dimension. All of us are aware that many of those who are orchestrating the, the menace are people who have been displaced from, from the Middle East, Iraq, etc., who are now through Libya found themselves in, 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 in the Sahelian region. So, if there are forces within the international community that also are, are sympathetic to our fight for stability and for freedom, yes, I think that uh, association is perfectly in order. Thank you, Mr. President, for <coughs> apologies for your vo views and perspective. On that note, I'd like to close the press conference. Well, I'd like thank to you. say one thing before you do. OK. <laughs> that is that at the end of it all, there's one thing that you've heard us being repeating, that we are fighting and working for Ghana beyond aid. I think that that is the message that I would like to conclude this press conference with, that we are looking to build a Ghana where we will no longer need aid from the so-called donor community because we will be able to stand on our own feet. And that's, that's the perspective that we're fighting for. Indeed, for an Africa beyond aid, an Africa that is self-reliant, that is standing on its own feet and being able to deal with those problems itself.
And one of the things that we would like to do in this process is, I don't know, now that I have become uh, uh, convert <laughs> to the Davos thing, is to bring the, West, the, the forum to Ghana in a year or two's time. Madam, we'll use it. <laughs> <laughs> well, on this very uh, wonderful message, <laughs> I'm very grateful to close the press conference. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.